pleasure of introducing today's speaker, uh, M.T. Vallarta, uh, who will be talking about brown shoutouts, trans, and non-binary Filipinx American poetry. So M.T. Vallarta is a poet and a PhD candidate in ethnic studies at the University of California, Riverside. They're studying contemporary queer Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex poetry and its role in conducting transformative resistance and futuristic desire that challenges the heteronormative regime of U.S. capitalism and colonialism in the Philippines and in the diaspora. In this presentation, uh, M.T. Vallarta will explore how contemporary Filipinx American poetry written by queer, trans, and non-binary artists functions as a conduit for social change and the cultivation of queer futures. So please join me in welcoming M.T. Vallarta. So thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And um, first thing I want to do is um, I just want to thank uh, Michael and Aaron for having me here. I am very honored to be a visiting scholar and chair in Transgender Studies Fellow. So one of the main key terms that is currently informing my project, so this presentation is titled Brown Shoutouts, Trans and Non-Binary Filipinex Poetry, um, is this term uh, Filipinex. Um, so this term uh, was generated sometime in the mid-2010s. The precise date is very, very uncertain. Um, I do know that the mobilization for this term happened online and also in youth and student activist spaces in uh, the United States. So it's a very US American uh, Western term. It is a very contested term. Um, it, the X um, represents a intervention into the Filipino, Filipina uh, gender binary, which is why a lot of Filipino folks who identify as queer, trans, or non-binary use, use this term in order to foster inclusivity um, and awareness of these queer LGBT plus identities in uh, Filipino, Filipina communities. However, I do want to acknowledge that there are Filipina and Filipino folks, particularly um, folks in the Philippines, um, the indigenous communities there who disidentify with this term because of its roots in Western uh, US American conceptions of gender and the fact that um, conceptions of gender identity outside of, the, outside of the West does exist in the Philippines. Um, so it's a very ambivalent term. It is shifting. Um, it shifts and transforms forms uh, depending on the social conditions of the time, which um, you know is reminiscent of Omi, Michael Omi and Howard Wynott's theory of racial formation, where race is um, not this um, immutable biological thing, but is actually reflective of the social conditions across time, space, and place. And I argue that the term Philippinex isn't necessarily um, just representative of Filipina or Filipino identity formation, but it can actually um, be a method in itself. So as I mentioned, uh, it is a contested term, Western US American, the X means that it does not conform to the gender binary. Um, one thing that I do want to emphasize is that it is a diasporic term, meaning that it is located outside of, of nationhood. And this is where I have seen um, the usefulness of this term and how it can be um, situated as a method rather than as a strategy for more um, for representation of fullness. Um, in David Ng's article, Out Here and Over There, uh, Queer Diasporas in um, Asian America, um, David Ng actually argues that diaspora is a function of queerness because you have these communities, these Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex communities located outside of the United States who contest 
the configurations of the nation itself with the transnational connections and transgressions that they make across multiple intersections. So as a diasporic term, it is queer in the sense that it transgresses the boundaries that um, nationhood uh, sets into place. Um, and with that, it produces a Filipino, Filipina, Filipinex ambivalence. And that's where I see this term functioning as a method, a shifting composition of difference, something that queer, trans, non-binary, Filipinex people enact um, as in three ways. So um, one of these ways is as a form of aesthetics. Um, we can see the term Filipinex being deployed um, in queer, trans, non-binary art as a part of Filipinex performativity and also in poetics. So I'm really interested in how Filipinex method is, constitu is constituted um, not only through these multiple art practices, but also through gesture, everyday gestures, um, the way people occupy space, the way people move in certain areas in public and private spaces um, within the quotidian. And I'm also very, very interested in affect, how these, uh, how Filipinex aesthetics in poetry and art produces these multiple instances of feeling and recognition, uh, queer feeling and recognition. And I'm also really interested in how Filipinex also functions as, an, as a performative utterance. In the words of J.L. Austin, how saying that term in itself activates a space um, that goes beyond the Filipina, Filipino, uh, gender binary. And I also argue that it functions as a theory. It's a form of critical thought. Some of the poets that I am, uh, two of the poets actually, that I, uh, I will be discussing today, Mark Aguhar and Kate Ulandai Barrett, they are exercising new and alternative ways to think about gender, to think about Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex identity formation. And I'm also arguing that it's also a form of resistance. Um, as a lot of folks know, uh, poetry is very, very much tied to social justice. Um, Audre Lorde, in her work, uh, she argues that you know poetry is one of the most um, economical methods for an artist and for an activist because um, regardless of you know how much of a time crunch you are in, um, if you have a pencil, a pen, a piece of paper, you can generate a poem. You know, in whatever time frame you have. So I'm really interested in how uh, poetry functions as a conduit of social change and how and the continuous role poetry plays in um, transformative justice. So how do we see Filipinex method um, being deployed specifically? Um, so I will be talking about the work of um, Mark Aguhar, so she uh, was a tra multidisciplinary trans feminine Filipinex um, artist. Uh, she was very, very active on Tumblr during the early to mid uh, 2010s. Um, she passed away on March 12, 2012, but her work is still very, very much um, celebrated today. And if you are interested in checking out um, her work, it's still available online. She has two Tumblrs. Um, her personal Tumblr goes by the handle um, Call Out Queen. Um, I think the URL now is callalqueen-blog.tumblr.com unless it has been changed in uh, in the week or so, but it should still be live. Um, most of her work should still be up there. And then she also has her professional portfolio, which is markaguhar.tumblr.com. So if, you're, if you are interested in uh, checking out the rest of her work, I highly recommend uh, going on Tumblr. It's public. Um, you can definitely look at her material at your own time. Um, so her personal Tumblr, Call Out Queen, um, was a space where she cultivated a queer, brown, high femme aesthetic. And with, with that, um, in her posts, um, a lot of her posts were very, very personal, where she would blog about her everyday life and the quotidian ways that she experienced um, white supremacy and other forms of institutional violences. But it was also a space where she um, posted her work. So 
in addition to these personal posts where she's calling out and critiquing white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, and fatphobia, um, she also has a plethora of artwork where those critiques are being exercised as well. And her, even though um, she, I, she identifies as Filipina, Filipinex, um, her work actually reached um, a huge, uh, a huge demographic of people where these um, demarcations of cross race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, generation, and even geographic location were crossed. One, uh, because it's the internet, you know, um, it's it's um, very very it's a lot easier to connect with queer, trans, and non-binary people online compared to, um, you know, back in the day where print media served as the primary medium for that. Um, but another reason too was because her work, and in particular her poetry itself, which I'm going to be talking about today, had a very, very expansive critique of queerness, of non-normativity, and the way um, a normative script uh, constrains everyone, uh, regardless of their gender or sexual identity. So, because of of her. Um, because of her analysis of, um, in the words of uh, David Ng, uh, Jack Halberstam, and uh, uh, David Ng, and I think Judith Butler, I don't remember the third author, but this, the introduction to um, what's queer about queer studies now, um, she presents a very, very similar critique to these theorists where she um, locates um, normal normalization, normativity, as a wider field of social violence. So that's why her work, I argue, was able to bridge these gaps, these boundaries, um, these demarcations. So uh, this is a poem from her uh, portfolio, from her professional Tumblr, mikeaguhar.tumblr.com. Um, the title is legend, as you can see it being repeated throughout at the top in these uppercase letters. Um, this is actually, um, I argue that it's actually a concrete poem. Um, so concrete poems are poems where um, design and spatiality are very are essential to the poem's form and to the poem's content. So as you can see here, um, Aguhar was playing with font with the color, with the texture. Um, it's a bit of a hot mess <laughs> of sorts, in, in order, if I can use that um, colloquial term, but it's a hot mess um, intentionally. Um, as you can see, it's in different colors. We have violet, purple, blue, green, uh, orange, uh, red and I think a dark red. I'm not sure how well these colors are going to be translating onto video, but it's definitely a rainbow. And to me, it's representative of the LGBT flag, the LGBTQ plus um, spectrum. And um, I also mentioned that she's playing with font. She's She intentionally used um, Comic Sans, which you know a lot of typographers call an ugly font, the casual font, which I think you know speaks to um, how funny and campy her work is as well. Her work is definitely critical with its um, call out of institutional violences, but Aguhar also had a way at poking fun and showing how um, ridiculous you know, um, normative constraints are um, through uh, the campiness of her work. So as I mentioned before, um, this poem I argue, functions as a critique of normative queer expression in the digital age, particularly in social media platforms. So if you look to the, um, the first line, I think it's in violet, um, at, the very, the, at the very end, you see the terms booty meat and two gay Virgos X2. Um, first time I saw that, I laughed because they kind of look like online handles, usernames that belong to people on social media. Um, two gay Virgos, SX2. Um, to me, she's poking, she's poking fun at um, astrology, <laughs> astrological um, culture, and how a lot of folks in uh, you know queer, trans, and LGBT communities oftentimes look to astrology as a form of spirituality, as a way to 
connect and get to know someone. But um, you know, as you all know, astrology isn't the end all be all to a, pers to a person's personality or how they're going to function in society. So I thought it was very, very funny how, um, how she was kind of poking fun at that. And she also has the term um, booty meat, which to me represents a critique of uh, fat phobia in, uh, in, uh, in queer culture. Um, so legend, in legend, Aguhar is also calling out um, the queer community's alliances with homo, na with homo nationalism, uh, which to me is also representative of the way this poem uh, is specifically designed and spaced out to look like the rainbow flag, the LGBT plus flag, which is a symbol of LGBT uh, plus equality. And if you look at the rest of Mark Aguhar's work, uh, she is actually very, very critical of equality and what this term represents and how, um, and how very, very, um, and how very, very uh, specific she was about not wanting to be included in regards to the privileges and the opportunities that uh, nor uh, normative people or normal people or people outside of the LGBTQ plus spectrum are hoping to achieve. Rather, she is um, that she would um, she was dedicated to imagining futures other forms of social organizations outside that goes beyond this um, that goes beyond this project of equality so I'm really interested in how um, how as an artist mark aguhar was already you know um, was already thinking about what does social justice really look like? What does transformative change really look like for uh, queer, trans, and non-binary communities? And her critique of fat uh, phobia continues throughout as well. Um, so you can see, you know, multiple of, uh, other terms that depict um, these disp depictions of fat phobia: monstruoso and smiller pants, um, right there in. I think that is blue. It was blue on my laptop, but I, I believe it's blue. Monstroso and Smiller Pants. And um, one thing about her work too was that she also connected um, fat phobia um, to um, to white supremacy and white standards of beauty. And she was really, really conscious about how her body, you know, as someone who identified as fat and was very explicit about, about being a fat femme Filipinx person, um, about how fat shaming is connected to these larger institu institutions of hierarchy and power. So, um, which is something that still that still needs to be expanded in a lot of gender and sexuality studies scholarship and even in race and ethnicity scholarships. So I'm really interested in investigating, you know, these connections between fat phobia and white supremacy that Mark Aguhar is making in her work. Um, so um, I asked uh, Michael to print out copies of Litany's to My Heavenly Brown Body, which is actually Aguhar's most um, provocative provocative, most widely circulated piece. Um, Litany's was actually circulated in 2016 um, after the 2016 uh, Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida. So to this day, her work still resonates and still very, very um, much well-loved by queer trans non-binary communities. So I'm going to be showing a video by um, documentary artist um, Jamal Lewis, I believe that's his name. And you also have the poem in front of you, so I'm just going to play this video. So just a few uh, comments about this poem. So um, it's in the form of a shout out. So Aguhar is acknowledging and um, also blessing these multiple communities that have been structurally queer, um, been produced non-normatively uh, by the US nation state, which doesn't just include uh, queer trans or non-binary people, but this expansive, um, this expansive um, analysis of 
of normativity and how it harms and constrains everybody. So if you look at the text um, that you have, you can see that she is bestowing blessings to the kinksters, um, to people of color, um, her beloved kith and kin, um, and as we know um, through um, extensive scholarship in race and ethnicity studies, um, people of color, in the, specifically in this case, people of color in the United States have been structurally queer <laughs> to the US. Um, in fact, and within the Asian American context, um, uh, um, the one of the reasons why the US government uh, passed um, immigration exclusion acts that drastically affected um, uh, Asian immigrant communities um, in the United States was due to the fact that a lot of Chinese and Filipino uh, migrants at this time at this time were transgressing uh, gender norms and the gender binary that was seen as aberrant, deviant, and threatening to the um, white nationalist state. And it, to me, um, Mark Aguhar's extensive analysis of um, of uh, normativity and its constraints um, harkens back to that um, history of immigration exclusion. Um, the poem is angry, unapologetic, raw. It definitely submerges us in a sense of urgency, fury, and demand, but it's also cognizant of um, pain and strength. Um, you know, when the speaker intentionally uses the word um, fuck and also um, uppercase letters to me as you know, as a rejection of, um, you know, the standards uh, of respectability politics, but it's also um, a, a shout out. It's also um, a gesture and extension for everyone who is constrained by the normative to participate in these uh, multiple utterances, these multiple iterations of fuck, and these multiple iterations of blessing. So there's this sense of recognition of um, pain, but there's also this um, gesture of um, collectivity and community that this poem is also extending to its readers. And to me, that's the reason why um, this poem is her most provocative one and the one that's most widely circulated, because it appeals to um, a very, very, um, to a very, very broad audience and it critiques um, what Audre Lorde has termed the mythical norm, and in her essay, she calls the mythical norm white, thin, male, young, heterosexual, Christian, and financially secure. So this poem um, functions as a blessing for everyone outside this mythical norm. It's an extension of queer futurity, the acknowledgement that you know the world that we live in is not enough, that um, imagining a future, a more fruit, fruitful tomorrow where everyone can truly be free and free of these um, normative constraints must be essential to a radical queer politics and to um, transformative justice. Um, the next poet I'm going to be talking about is Kay Ulandai uh, Barrett, who is also a contemporary poet. Both Aguhar and Barrett are uh, contemporary. So Kay Ulandai Barrett is a transmasculine and non-binary uh, Filipinx poet, cultural worker, and also a disability justice advocate. So. Barrett specifically identifies as a cultural worker. They are very, very um, upfront about that because um, because Barrett is also a huge um, advocate and and for the disability justice movement. And one of the ways and um, as based on um, Joanna Hedva's article, um, Sick Woman Theory, that was published in Mask Magazine, um, Hedva makes this argument that for folks who have disability, um, mass mobilizations, uh, militant forms of protest aren't always a viable strategy for people who have disabilities, for people who um, cannot move in these able-bodied ways. So Barrett and Hedva both ask, you know, if you're disabled, if you're queer, if you are a person of color, what are some of the ways that you can partake in these mobilizations while still um, managing to care for yourself? And for Barrett, um, that is uh, poetry and also through um, their education. They're also an educator. They tour around 
around the United States. I'm not sure if they've been to Canada yet, but I'm sure they would be delighted to be here one day. Um, Agohar's uh, first poetry, major poetry collection came out in 2015 called When the Chant Comes. They do have an, a new collection that's going to be released, I believe, sometime next year. And like um, Agohar, they also write in the form of the shout out. And I am going to show an example of, of their version of the shout out with this poem, Homeboys Don't Write Enough. Um, just a few comments about this poem. So it's also using the form of the shout out um, where Aguhar isn't just speaking to um, homeboys, uh, trans men, trans masculine uh, folks, but there's also a shout out to um, the, the larger uh, Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex community, particularly the Filipina, Filipino, Filipinex migrant community with those lines about um, burning the American dream. So again, um, Barrett has this extensive analysis of queerness and in this poem is all, there's also this examination of how um, Filipino folks have been structurally queer to the United States. Um, in an interview with Lambda Literary, um, Barrett was asked, you know, why do you use the form of the shout out in your work? Why is it so useful to your craft as a poet? And um, Barrett stated, I believe in celebrating those who've done the work before and alongside you. I want to convey not simply respect for what people are surviving, but identify the communal power of queer trans people of color being listed one after another, almost like a chant, which to me is also takes after uh, Mark Aguhar's legacy, particularly litanies to um, my heavenly brown body where um, that poem is also functioning as a chat um, there are also amens throughout kind of like a prayer in ho that you see in church which is also harkens to um, Agahara's uh, Catholic uh, upbringing and um, you know some some um, instances that this poem includes also um, uh, calling out how uh, trans men, trans masculine folks um, can internalize uh, misogyny. There's that line asking, are you going to be that missile that blasts your woman until she misses you, even when you will both be in the same bed? And um, one thing that, uh, that um, Barrett is advocating for in this poem is, you know, self-love, self-care, and self-preservation as an act of survival. How we can find potentiality, transformative change through these acts of ten tenderness. Um, in addition to, and this is a line of a po of the from the poem pummeling cusses of strangers scared of difference. So how can working on and, con and critically interrogating the self, how is self-preservation, especially for queer, trans, non-binary, and disabled communities, how does self-preservation, uh, particularly through poetry, poetics, function as a form of uh, transformative change? And to go back to you know the work I've been doing the past few days at the Chair in Transgender Studies Archive. So these are some of the poems that I found um, in the archive, particularly through issues of transgender tapestry. I'm not sure if folks can see it, but um, these were some of the poems that really intrigued me. Um, two of them are written by um, by uh, people of color, particularly um, um, Asian folks, so this one, Diagnostic Detour, and this other one, um, for Deborah Forte, Rita Hester, Victims of Transphobia. And the one on the, um, to my far left, titled Free to Be My Own Gender by Angela Dobbs uh, Ciotino. I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation. Um, to me, that form is also, that poem is also reminiscent of the form of the shout out too, because you see some of these lines, do not treat me as whatever gender you perceive me to be, treat me for who I am and what I do. You know, it's very, it's very blunt, uh, very clear, and it sounds like the speaker is definitely talking talking back in, you know, um, in opposition to something, to these instances of um, uh, violence and microaggression. So um, really, one thing that I'm really looking at in, with this archive is, you know, how, why is the shout out such a viable form for uh, transgender and non-binary poetry and how 
are these contemporary poets that I'm examining? How, what connections do they have to this larger genealogy of um, queer, trans, and non-binary poems? And these are some of the research questions that I've been looking at um, throughout my time here. So how did print cultures help construct and constitute a transgender identity and community? Um, my current project right now with my dissertation, um, a lot of the work that I've been looking at is lo localized, is situated online. Um, I'm, I believe I'm a millennial. I spent a lot of time on the internet when I was a, when I was a child. So um, I'm also really interested in looking at electronic electronic literatures and social media and how these everyday forms of expression on social media are extent, extensions of these larger um, literary um, literary genealogies. Um, but that genealogy is also connected to this, you know, more expansive, larger genealogy in a print media and print culture. So how can these connections between print and the digital be made? And what are some you know, similarities and departures do both of these cultures, these exercises of digital expression, of queer expression have with one another? And the second question, how are the social political conditions of transgender people reflected in the formal elements of poems? So my work is very, very much informed um, by Dorothy Wong's uh, argument in thinking its presence about how when we analyze poetry, um, it's very key that we don't just focus on the meaning or the content that the poem is reflecting, but how do the formal elements of the poem, the figuration, the language being used, the enjambment, the, you know, the spatial design, if the color, if it's a concrete poem, how are these formal elements also reflecting the social, economic, social, political conditions in time? So I'm really interested in looking at that. And then finally, how does poetry continue to be a key method in resistance and resilience for transgender communities. There is a reason why poetry functions as a key tool in social justice, in transformative change, in mobilizing queer, trans, non-binary communities of color. So why is poetry such a key method in uh, facilitating these acts of resistance in um, institutional violence? So. I just wanted to thank everyone for listening, and if you have any questions, I would be very, very happy to um, answer them. But also, like I said, uh, Mark Agohar's work is still public and available online. Um, a lot of uh, Kate Ulandai Barrett's work is available too. So um, if there's a question that um, that you, you also came up with that you did later on after this talk, um, my contact information is also up there. Uh, please feel free to email me whenever you can uh, at mval008 at ucr.edu. And if you're ever in Los Angeles or Riverside, I would be very happy to connect. So